Welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast, a production from Empowering Pumps and Equipment as the voice of the pump and related equipment industry. Hey, I love it! Aggies! <laughs> Roll time! <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to episode 77 of the Empowering Industry Podcast, coming out October the 11th, uh, which is following the Texas A&M <laughs> and Alabama Crimson Tide ball game. So we'll see what that's all about next week. But I'm your host, Charlie Matthews, clearly an Alabama fan, and bring, I also am joined by my co-host, Bethany Walmack. Hey everyone. We record on Friday before the episode comes out on Monday. So right now I'm living in this oblivious, happy place where A&M hasn't lost by 50 plus points to Alabama. Um, we lost to a Mississippi school at home. So like our season is completely shot, um, if that means anything to any of you. But so I'm just having fun wearing my maroon. And She's talking I- all kinds of <laughs> trash already. She's sending videos. <laughs> I mean, just to Carter, like I just have it in my head that he's like the funnest person to pick on when it comes yes. to this. And so I'm sitting those videos specifically for him to watch. So I'm going to need well, you to I, make that happen. I did. I, I showed him that at like 10 30 <laughs> PM last night when she sent it. So she's all geared up. She's ready to go. And, um, you know, this is, this is the best part about recording on a Friday before yes. the game happens. Um, but I forgot to tell everybody last week that I went to Nick at noon, which is, it really is fun to have a coach that cares about leadership, but he does say the same things like do your job over and over again. (laughs) Um, Is he, does he look dead in the eyes? Because he looks dead to me every time I see him win a national championship dead in the face with like lose by 50 points, same expression. Like, Well, in the, in the lunchroom, I guess is what you call it. Um, (laughs) He's himself, I guess. There's a little bit more uh, since he's not being recorded and we can't share yeah. it via social media. He's a little bit more loose in what he says. Um, but I do th- I, I do think I there's digress. a lot to I'm learn. I'm jealous. I'm just jealous. He's he's awesome. He's a great person. Um, I think he does some really great things personally. And I'm glad you get to you know learn from a great leader. And someday can, he will retire and A&M can win a national championship. That's all I'm saying. Well, I'm going to say, I was going to say, okay, now tell us the highlight for, since you've already crushed, crushed, crushed your dreams over there <laughs> for the weekend. Um, but why do you like the Aggies? Um, well, so I went to school there and it's more like a cult than it is uh, a fandom, I guess. I think that at a and we've never been super good. We don't have a ton of t-shirt fans. And so we feel like we're all we've got. Um, but you know, just a lot of fun memories. That's where I met Mark and went to all the games and it's just something fun. And, and we enjoy the punishment of watching us getting our hopes up and then losing every single season. So it's just, well, (laughs) I have to say that I love it and I pull for the Aggies because of the Texas A&M, uh, TPS, the pump symposium and all the Aggies that go, um, and that we know in our industry. So, you know, I'm a fan. (laughs) Um, I just have never been, and, you know, I hate that I'm not going this weekend. I mean, I don't know why we didn't plan that, Bethany. One day, one day we definitely will. Um, they just need to have the game after WEF Tech, and I think we can make it happen probably. But um, thank you all for indulging me in this moment and Charlie. And I'll get us back on track and tell you that we're excited to be here. We're excited that you're here. Today we're going to talk about social media preview the news from Empowering Pumps and Equipment, and bring you an industry interview. Um, But Charlie, how was your week? Uh, Well, this was the best part of my week. I mean, I just get to see you and listen and, you know, find out, you know, what's going on, what our listeners want to hear about and talk for us to talk about. So I am curious from everybody else what kind of fans they are. And so send us a message and let us know who you're rooting for on the weekends. Um, But my week was good. I'm preparing for travel season. I've got um, something on my calendar for every week of October (laughs) and November. So um, if you have any travel tips or, you know, decompression time tips, um, send them my way too. But, you know, I had a great week and I love it. Um, Everything is coming together for, for our event, the Empowering Women event, and just just a lot of happy, happy moments this week. What about you? 
Yeah, it, pretty much the same. Spending a lot of time preparing for our trade shows that are coming up and empowering women. But uh, one fun story that I did want to share was that I got guilted into getting my flu shot this week because I took both my boys, someone give me a medal, but both of them by myself to the pediatrician for their, you know, annual checks and shots and all of that. And we've been telling Bowen, you know, he's got to get four shots and this is his last appointment. He's going to get all these shots. And so we've been prepping him and talking about how they don't hurt that much, just a little, and then you're healthy and strong, you know? And so we get there and the nurse comes in and she's got their shots and they were like, Hey mom, we also have flu shots for parents too. If you want to go ahead and get your flu shot. And Bowen's like, mom, we get to get a shot together. We can be happy and strong. I think it worked, Bethany. You seem super happy today. I, I don't know. I'm with a bow in on that. Well, it's my first one in 10 years. So um, good for both of us. But it was a, you know, I feel like every parent's probably been there at some point. Oh, I just um, cry. I absolutely cry in there. When they gave my little boys a shot, I was crying. Now, Carly was different. I'm super tough on her. And it's just the way it is. I hate that, but I am. You got to do some work on the inside. For that. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, like toughen up, girl. You've been through a lot. You can handle this little shot. Um, but yeah, I feel you and your pain of having to do that with two. Um, yeah. yeah. But we but survived and uh, we've had a good productive work week. And so we're excited to be here and, you know, start the podcast with you. Yes. Okay. One more thing. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know that the October digital edition went out. Um, it was a labor of love and I'm super happy that it's out and done that y'all can all see that. Um, some awesome things we talked about last episode. If you want to dive into that a little bit more links in the show notes and check it out. Cause you know, we worked on it, getting all these amazing people for you to hear about. And we worked hard to get it out now, right ahead of trade show season. You know, it's busy for us too. We know it's busy for you, but it's like, it's when all this content is super valuable for you. And so we're just here to make things good for our audience, right? I um, think so. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, and yeah. <laughs> One more thing we want to invite you to Empowering Women, which is the day after WEF Tech, October 21st. I think from today, we're looking at two weeks uh, from... I can't do math. Uh, we're two weeks away from our event and we're yes. really excited and we'd love to have you there as well. Uh, there are a couple of spots left, uh, even if you will have your name tag printed on site. We can do it. <laughs> we can do it. Yeah. We'll let you in. Just let us know. Okay, so time to get social. Sis, this is a segment where we're going to fill you in on something amazing that you need to know about social media for your personal brand today. So definitely want to listen. Yeah, and we are going to be hosting some virtual meetups. Um, our first one is going to be for Empowering Women. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday, October the 13th. Uh, Rebecca is going to be hosting us uh, on that one. It's going to be 11 a.m. Central Time. Log in. Uh, Amy Crosby is going to sharing her story. It's going to be awesome. I'm just inspired by her. So I hope that you, I've already heard her story, thankfully, because I'll be at Valve World Americas. But um, jump on there and, you know, you know, share um, your screen, your personality, your cheers with um, Amy, because it really is a great testimony. Um, so, so jump on that. We are going to cancel actually the Empowering Brands meetup because of WEF Tech and our whole team will be there on site. So we'll just have to, you know, see you in November for our next um, virtual meetup and we'll have a big reunion there online. Yep. Pre-register, you'll get the links, and then see all of us at WEF Tech. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, and mention us. You know, we would like to sh get the shout-outs. We like to give the shout-outs. But you mention us at Empowering Pumps or using the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast. Um, if somebody uses that hashtag without me asking them to, I mean, without me like, hey, I don't know where I was going with that, but just go ahead and use that hashtag, <laughs> like spell it out in the post. I'll, I'm going to send you a prize. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, my shout outs this week, we just had a new episode of Empowering Women come out uh, where Shannon, who's our amazing host, we talk about all the time, interviewed Karen Laos, who is also a speaker at Empowering Women coming up in a couple of weeks. I love Karen. She also hosts her own podcast, and now I've gone and subscribed to that. I just, she has this infectious laugh. She has just great advice for, you know, getting out of your own way and, um, and Confidence. how to find how your to command power. a room. Yeah. Yes. I just, 
I kind of want her to be my mom. Like, I mean, I love my mom, but I could have like another one, right? Like she's amazing. The podcast Honorary is mom. great. Yes. And you can come to Empowering Women and hear her as well. Yes. She's awesome. And she's also on Clubhouse giving away yes. free advice if you want to be, join her there. Um, okay. My shout out is going to be actually to Shadrach Stevens, who we've talked about on here. Um, he is with Re Engineer, And I'm just... I really am enjoying seeing this world of media merge with maintenance and reliability and STEM, and it just makes me happy. So anyway, he actually did use the hashtag and uh, send me and a what mention. Prize? And yes. what prize did he get? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, there another shout out. Um, yeah. But <laughs> also, um, uh, Kaylee Looney with reInvent, not to confuse those two. I talked to her today and I'm just really excited to be working with her. We've got several things coming up. So if you're coming to the Empowering Women Conference, you're going to meet her, see her and hear about the things that we're going to do together. And so just a lot of fun. Like we said, October is filled with things, people, experiences. It's, it's just a great month. Yeah. Okay. So the main tip, trick, wisdom we're going to impart on you today is how to build your personal brand during trade shows. And we're putting this out right now because Valve World is this week, if you're listening to this on Monday. WEF Tech is coming up. Empowering Women is coming up. TPS is in December. We have all these trade shows coming out that we want you to be your best self for and build that personal brand if that's what you're wanting to do. So quick overview, personal brand is what people think of when they think of you. You know, it's, it's your skills, it's your expertise, your personality, your story, um, your behaviors, all of these things rolled into one and what people see when they see you. So when we talk about it, we're usually talking about it as your social media presence, but really it's also your in-person uh, brand that you're giving to people as well. And it's really, really important for those of you in B2B sales and to work for these large manufacturing um, companies and all of these pump companies that we talk to because people buy from people, they learn from people, and building that personal brand will only help them trust you more and make people see you as a thought leader. So should bring you opportunities either in your current company or your career at large. So absolutely. And I love what you said about showing up. It, it really is about, you know, how you show up in online or in person, it is how people, how you make people feel and what they think about when they think, see you. Um, and so one of the things that I want to talk about is your personal branding in events. So like when you're going to be in an event, make sure that you have all of your social channels, your profile set up, that they match, they represent the way that you want to show up. And so if you, you know, change yours a lot like me, just look at them every now and then and make sure that they are concise, that they have the message that, um, you know, in your bio that you want to represent um, or send out into the world. Um, and I think you can tweak that too, based on what event that you're going to. So a lot of people are going to go to your social channels and check you out. Um, and so you want to make sure that you know, make it easy for them if they're looking for you. Is that, okay, I just met that person at a show. Is that them? And it looks consistent to where you are. So I always That's like to- That's a great tip to yeah. change it for different events. Something I hadn't really yes. thought of, but great advice. Well, well, and also like how people see you. Um, for me, I have my red jacket that is in a lot of my pictures. So I almost feel the need to wear my red jacket to in-person events so that Do people it. can can spot me, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, red is a good color for that anyway, which I yeah. love. Um, okay, so we want you to participate both in person and virtual. Um, and the way that we can do that, you know, when you're in person at an event, you're going to want to look for ways you can be a speaker, um, how you can, you know, visit the exhibit hall. Maybe there is a turbo stage that you can go and join <laughs> um, and be a part of. So look for ways that you can speak um, and be vocal, Make maybe ask a question or two while you're there, um, stand up, raise your hand. All these things are really important for in-person events. And then, you know, one of the things that I'll be doing, and we didn't talk about this, but I am preparing to speak at an event, Valve World Americas in Houston. Um, so as this is coming out, it will be that same week. And 
I looked for that opportunity, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to walk the expo floor, but then they have these little speakers corners. So it wasn't an extra session kind of separate to that is where I'm going to be. And so look for opportunities like that. Okay. Where and, are you going to be? And one thing you did for that is you're promoting that you're telling your audience that you're going to be speaking at valve world at the speaker's corner. And I think that's an important element too, to help people know that they need to come listen to you, you know? Yeah. What do you stand for? So I, I, absolutely uh, love what I'm going to be talking about, right? How we transition to this digital world um, through the pandemic and, and the changes of that. So, you know, how can you tie that speaking opportunity into your actual brand and what you're trying to represent? So that's really important. Uh, the also, also there's a way, you know, to go to an event, um, let's say for WefTech, uh, where you have an app or so you can virtually participate don't forget that you can virtually participate when you're at a live event as well. So you need to do both. You need to look at these uh, apps when they're offered to you at events. Um, I was just listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart uh, podcast, and I want to actually go and try to get them on a show. I think they'd be fun. But they were talking about how efficient these apps are for when you get back home. So you can participate on these apps, uh, all the different trade show apps, you know, click on the speaker, say hello to them, post questions in the chat. But then if, if you come back home after the event, you know, you can download all that information, which I thought was a great point, but like we've done yeah. it before at events. Um, but they, they put it all together in a nice little package. So just stop trying to reinvent the wheel and yeah. like actually use the tools that they're giving you. So I thought it was a great point and made me want to have them on our show under this segment. So I there support. you go. I support that 100%. When you're talking about participating in person and finding ways to speak up and stand up and raise your hand, it reminded me, I want to say maybe like a year ago, we were talking about, uh, which now feels naive, transitioning back to in-person life and how you need to go to the grocery store and practice saying hello to people, you know, because we've been out of practice. But maybe now is a good time for all of you people that are going in person to WefTech. I haven't been to an in-person trade show since the pandemic started, but practice looking people in the eye and saying hi or speaking out loud before you get there so you're not nervous or something like that. Just It's a real thing. I've been <laughs> I've been preparing myself like constantly on how am I going to be able to talk to people yeah. again. Um that's not like, you know, in your community or your kids football players or whatever. Um so it it should be fun. I think everybody just go into it and know that you're going to have a little bit of anxiety about this. Yeah. But practice just makes perfect, right? So just keep doing it. Yeah. This is true. Uh, okay. So the next step to making sure that you're building your personal brands during events is to make sure you're participating in social media before, during, and after. Um, but so before, right now, when you're listening to this, get on your social media, check out those WefTech hats. Wef tech hashtags, see who's on there talking, you know, use the hashtags, interact with them, follow people to expand your network um, and start posting content that you're a thought leader on or that you want to be a thought leader on so that when these people that you meet at the events, when they go and find you on LinkedIn, they're seeing content that you've posted that's valuable and they're like, oh, this is a good person that I need to plug in with and make sure I've added to my network. Yeah, it's uh, really good points. Uh, I, I was just looking at somebody today and I thought they probably should post something more recent um, to their, you know, social channels just to say who they are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and then one other tip that I heard a, a friend talk about who is now a CEO at a marketing company in like her late 30s. I don't I mean, mo one of the most successful people. One day we're having lunch and she was talking about going to events and she was like, oh, I always spend like 20, 30 bucks on Twitter ads when I'm at events. And I was like, for you or for your company? And she's like, no, for me. So that people like I, I get a bigger reach at events. And so, you know, she does the ad to do a specific area around the event. So Chicago are going to WEF Tech and gets new followers. And so, you know, something to think about if you're really thinking about growing that influence, especially in Twitter. Yeah. And we're doing that um, through the Empowering Pumps channels yeah. too. So if you're interested in doing that for your business, I want to target people in different areas. We know how to do that. Um, 
My next tip is to stay active um, and do that social social listening after the event. Um, I think this is really important. Sometimes, you know, you put all this effort into, you know, preparing to go to an event and then it's exhausting to kind of be at an event and try to juggle everything. And then you might forget like after the event is where the magic happens. You can go back and look through who was actually participating. Um, I think it's really important to search those social channels and see who was participating on certain topics. Um, So not just, okay, who interacted with the hashtag? That's one thing you absolutely need to do, but look for like the key people who are engaging and like having conversations. Uh, That's really, um, you know, my favorite part is to find somebody who went to the event, who was really active at the event, and then continues to kind of show their personal brand around a topic that I'm interested in. Perfect. Okay. So to sum it up for you, you are trying to build your brand and we're going to help you do that while you're at WefTech and Valve World and these trade shows that are coming up this fall. Here's your action items. You need to update your profile pictures and all your platforms. Um, interact with customers and your audience prior to the event, participate while you're there. Just be happy, be excited to be there, Um, get everything out of it that there is to offer. And then I would say make a commitment to yourself to post and interact on social regularly, maybe 15 minutes a day for sure, you know, in the morning when you wake up or in the evening before you go um, to bed during those events so that you can make sure that you're present and there and people can see you. Yeah. And it doesn't take very long. I mean, you can just kind of check in in the morning, like she said, um, five minutes uh, on social before you kind of go into an event and then check to see who responds to you after. I think it's a really great thing. Um, I do want to just plug one more time. You know, I will be traveling a lot. Look for us using the hashtag um, this week at Valve World Americas. It's VWAM2021. Um, and then, of course, WefTech is just hashtag WefTech. And then uh, we'll be at SMRP. Uh, What else is after that? What am I missing? Oh, the Empowering Women uh, Conference. So Empowering Women 2021. Follow along with our hashtags and mention us and, you know, we'll see what happens. Perfect. Okay. We're going to move into the news. That was very slow this time, not 100% sure why, but got the point across. This is a segment where we're going to preview the news that's coming out on Empowering Pumps and Equipment newsletter this week. Sign up for that so you get it in your inbox twice a week. And we start with the person of the week. And I believe you're a fan, Charlie. I am. I uh, actually met her through Twitter, which I always love to tell people that when I meet somebody through a social media platform, because it's real and it's important to our networking skills here. Okay. So I'm super proud to have Janelle Armstrong. Um, She is actually our Pump Talk celebrity. So she was in the digital edition. She's the engineering manager at Charleston Sanitary Board. And I just love following her on Twitter because she's showing us what her life is like there, right? She's showing us the pictures of the water treatment plants and, you know, her everyday life. And I think that, you know, some people kind of like whatever people's posting about um, their day, but it actually shows us, you know, that these workers are just like us. They have everyday lives and they are doing the essential work um, to give us clean water. Um, And I just... I just love following her. So I'm a huge fan and um, you should follow her too on Twitter. We'll put the links in the show notes and she's just a, a really, really cool person. What about you? What did you think? Yeah, she is awesome. I love her pink shirt uh, that's in the picture for her celebrity profile. Her Twitter handle is at Jen L. Paso, so J-E-N-L-P-A-S-O, um, which we will share for sure. And one of the cool things was that she just talked about how, you know, even after 24 years, she's constantly learning new things for one, which is what I want to hear from the people that are handling my water sanitation. Like, though, I want those people out of all people to be constantly learning and, and on top of their their skill. So thank you, Jen. And thank you to all of the essential water workers out there uh, for getting me clean water. I don't take it for granted for sure. That's right. Um, So check out her profile. Um, It's on the website. And also when you get a chance, nominate someone else to be our person of the week. Uh, We love to be able to 
promote people, share their stories and connect. Um, you know, you may be needing somebody in this area. So um, share, uh, share with us and we'll share them with the world. Perfect. I feel like today, especially when we get to the interview, we'll be talking a lot about sustainability, which is uh, an exciting or which is one of the reasons that I think this news story plays especially well today that we want to preview for you. So I have ABB unveils game changing ABB ability e mine to fast track transitions to all electric mines. So, um, which is so cool if you think about it, like completely converting mines to be all electric uh, would have really big impacts on, you know, the levels of CO2 and emissions and all of these things that our industry has been working for a long time, I think, to address. And so um, it's fun to see that they're making progress. Um, so they've, they've launched um, eMine, which is a portfolio of solutions that will help accelerate the move to a zero carbon mine. And there's a quote in here from Max Ludke, the global head of mining at ABB, that says the global mining industry is undergoing one of the most significant and important transformations of our generation, and that's to become zero carbon. Um, this uh, operation that they've released, it fully integrates, you know, electrification in the digital systems from mine to port. So end to end, they can help it out, help you out. And the article is really long and it goes into the capabilities that this capabilities, there's a pun for ABB ability, um, e-mine. And it's just, it's really neat to read and, and learn about. And so I would definitely say, check it out so you can learn more about an electric mine. Yeah, I am loving ABB and I'm so glad they're one of our partners because we get to hear about all these innovative things. And um, if you haven't hit listened to HJ's um, um, Howard do his, um, <laughs> his podcast interview with us, go back and take a look at that because um, it was really fun too and just innovative around electric vehicles. We talked about that and circularity. So anyway, I, I'm just a big fan. Okay. So my story is cavitation protection in water treatment plants. And this is by Clay Valve. And I am really excited to share this because it's a lot of information. And so anytime we can have a white paper or a case study that we can share, um, it, it's always great. And I think anytime we're talking about cavitation, um, our listeners absolutely get that. So this is, um, I've forgotten how to say the name all, all of a sudden of the water treatment plant, but I think you say that, uh, who knows uh, yes. someone, not okay. me. <laughs> so, so they're actually in central Vietnam and were built in early 2018, um, and receives, um, raw water from sources like 137 meters above sea level, and it needs to have the pressure reduced to 10 meters before it is supplied to the plant. So you can imagine that's a big change in the pressure. Um, and so damaging cavitation is present. So air in the lines and things like that um, just cause and wreck havoc on our systems, right? So we're going to talk about that in this story and how they solve that problem. Um, talks about the control valve and cavitation, um, the causes, the prevention, effects, limits, um, the sources of the low pressure, pressure recovery, um, design parameters, and the valve application. So a lot of different things that you can address and change and adapt. Um, and that's what they talk about within this case study. So when anytime it says case study, it's like, okay, there was a, a problem solved, a solution happened, and now we get to tell people about it. So check it out. Yes. Thanks, Clayval, for sharing that with us. Um, it's always a great opportunity for our audience to get to learn something, as is the industry interview, which we're excited to bring to you today. Um, Charlie, would you like to introduce your guest? Yes. Um, and you've heard from her before because she was our uh, person of the week uh, just a few weeks ago. And so Amanda Hunter, she is the Senior Service Solutions Consultant for Grumpus. And over the past five years, Amanda has focused on innovation in many industrial settings, including compressors and pumps. But I was just really intrigued to hear about her background. Uh, her education was actually in public health, uh, so in the healthcare sector. And so when you talk about sustainability and water, those two play hand in hand, right? And, and it really also tells you that she cares about improving people's lives. And really, it just comes through in the interview. Um, she, you know, is super active and fun and loves the outdoors. We talked a little bit about her being a rugby coach before, um, but just happy to develop people and help people and make a sustainable 
future for everyone. So I'm happy to give you a deep dive into her story, and I hope you like the interview. Awesome. So without further delay, here's your interview. Welcome, Amanda. I'm so excited to have you on the Empowering Industry Podcast. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I learned a little bit about you because of our Industry Person of the Week highlight, uh, which is how we've introduced everyone to you. And, you know, before reading that and, you know, getting to talk to you a little bit, I was just so fascinated by you coaching rugby. Um, So I will get into that. But before that, let's just go ahead and just talk about you, kind of who you are and what's your story. Yeah. So I, uh, my name is Amanda Hunter. I currently work for Grunfest, but my journey into the industry was uh, unique, I guess. It's non-traditional. So I actually came from the healthcare space where I worked in public health for a handful of years and then kind of fell into some industrial manufacturing just right place, wrong time, I guess, or right time, depending how you look at it. Um, And really discovered my passion, I guess, for sustainability. So before, you know, in the healthcare side of things, I was focused a lot on individual people and the health of of them and the health of their communities. And that really extended to the health of the planet and and the people, Mm -hmm. you know, in those communities outside of that. And so um, I kind of discovered, you know, with my work with the industrial, first and industrial manufacturer I worked for, which was an air compressor company. Um, I was doing some energy studies and stuff with them and realized just like the incredible impact that optimizing manufacturing can have, you know, globally. And so that's really what got me into the pump industry is that I, you know, kind of discovered Grunfuss and we had a really like nice melding there where I could take some of my experience from you know, industry, and then combine that with a lot of their goals around sustainability and, you know, making a an energy efficient pump and making people's lives better, right, through water and uh, just being able to really directly impact a lot of those global goals around sustainability in a way that I did not uh, see coming. If you would have asked me in college or grad school, if this is where I would have ended up, my answer would have been absolutely not. I didn't even know, you know, I you don't think about water pumps unless you're in water pumps or like pump business. Right. So I don't right. even thought about them on a day-to-day basis, but it's really well, I cool. Thought that part, yeah. I <laughs> thought that part of your um, write-up was really interesting and I can totally relate to, you know, just doing your job or going through life and not seeing, you know, the wastewater treatment plant. And now you do, you see it in every aspect of your lives where pumps and equipment play and not even yeah. just that you think about, you know, the people that are behind it, making it work. And so uh, I love that part. I love the sustainability aspect. And I thought about how great that ties together with Grumpus. First, you think about water and all of their, their um, missions around water. Um, We're definitely supporting them this year for the walk for water that was done in September. And so I, I get that part. And, and then I found out that you're part of the service side of the business. So tell me about your role within the company now. Yeah. So I, because of my, my focus on sustainability, I'm really part of Grumpus's digital offerings, which a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, and that falls under our service umbrella. So of course we, you know, manufacture pumps. Everyone kind of knows that about us, but we also have a full service offering. So out in the market with, you know, whether that's repair services or, um, service contracts. But the thing that gets me really excited is around energy audits, is around uh, reliability of machines. So pumps, of course, that's our bread and butter, but really, you know, just equipment and people's facilities and our customers or our partners' facilities and helping them to decrease their carbon footprint and to reduce waste from their side by bringing to market a lot of ways for them to do that, right? Keeping their machines up and running and, and running well. Yeah, and we know that pumps and motors you know, take up so much of our world's uh, energy. And even just updating some of the equipment or l- finding out how it runs, uh, to your point with the machinery health, um, this is going to help us fight some of that waste that's happening in the energy sector. And I, I do, I think that our industry, um, I'll call it the pump and related equipment industries, they have such an opportunity to really make a difference in this area for our world, especially um, in reducing that ca- carbon footprint. So um, 
you, you mentioned a little bit about it, the digital services, um, the machinery health. I've been hearing about that for years, um, you know, as I've been in the industry. But, you know, when I think about Grumpus, you think water. Is this going outside of that space to to just uh, plants in general, um, you know, different facilities? How how can you tell us a little bit about that part? Yeah, so absolutely. Water is a huge piece of our business still, right? Wastewater and water treatment, water utilities. But this really touches on industrial manufacturing as well. So any really any industry that is using a pump, which is pretty much every industry, this can right. impact that, right? So the concept around the machine health or really at its core is a vibration monitoring platform. Some industries have been into this for, for years and years and years, and some haven't done it at all, and they're just starting to dip their toe in. But what Grunfuss is trying to do is make it easy, right? So we want to make it so that this is something where you can monitor your equipment and you can keep it running well, but you don't have to put a lot of man hours into it. You don't have to have a lot of understanding of vibration analytics. It's kind of like pushing the easy button, right? So that's where we're really trying to make a difference in the space. It's not that the, the concept is new or that the technology itself is new, but it's making it easy to adopt, easy for people to use so that, you know, we can impact a lot more people a lot quicker. Yeah. And so if somebody's interested in this and they're going to um, need you to kind of come out to the facility, is that how that works? You, you kind of come in and, and look at the equipment and suggest something to them? Yeah. So a lot of facilities will have some kind of criticality assessment around their pumps and around their equipment because for them, the bottom line, of course, we all want to make the environment better, but money is a huge piece, right? So preventing lost production, pre like preventing costly maintenance bills, being more strategic. Mm -hmm. So usually the first step would be looking at their criticality assessment of their assets. Some people already have this and you can start kind of from the top, right? And we hit the most critical pieces first. Uh, and if you don't have it, that's absolutely where our team would come out and help you to create that kind of, of hierarchy for your, for your plant or for your facility. Yeah, it, it reminds me of marketing uh, where I'm like, I love a good marketer, right? They've got all of their content and their their images and everything is up and running and we can just go. Uh, but then there's some times where we have to kind of help them get to that point. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's we can do both. And so we we need to do that that first initial work sometimes to make it run a lot better, um, the system and the process. So um, just understanding what the process is uh, makes a lot of sense for y'all to come in and get to know the client um, and see, you know, what is profitable, what is, you know, critical, I guess, is, is um, in some places, it doesn't matter if it's profitable or not. It's critical. It has to work. You <laughs> it has know? to be up. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so the digital services, you've got the operation services, repair services. Um, when I heard service side of the business, you know, I went straight, my mom went straight to repair. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, that we have to overcome, right. To, to really be looking at the whole system. You gotta think about the reliability of the system. And I think with, we've been doing a lot of work with the maintenance community, um, which is a, a you know run by a software company and and they kind of pulled all these people together, but the main thing is that community and what are they struggling with? What keeps them up at night? And you know their equipment running is number one thing, uh, making sure that happens. But is there any other I guess problem solved that y'all do um, that we, we can highlight here? Uh, like around the maintenance side of things. Yes. I mean, I think the biggest piece so. People, just like you said, you know, when you hit the nail on the head, the first thing they're thinking of is just keep me running, right? Let's just talk repairs. Let's just keep me up and running. I think the, the big thing that comes after that, after you accomplish that, I guess, end to firefighting is yes. really the way you can be strategic around your maintenance planning. And that's where we use what's called a, a customer success engine. So you would have a person, right, who's supporting our customers or our partners in this predictive journey. And so they help them to really design strategic programs so that not only are you now not firefighting, but you're being really proactive. And so it allows your maintenance technicians to really understand their machines a lot better and be able to know what's coming. So it's not just that when they go home, they can be home, but it's that when they're at work, they, they know what their day is going to look like versus they're coming in and they're figuring it out on the fly based on what happened overnight. Right. And do the you, sec oh, sorry, go ahead. 
that well i was going to ask if do you see any pushback on that do you hear like is it is it a struggle for a maintenance person to kind of adopt this system is there I mean, I feel like there there's some education part of that, but then adoption as well. Yeah, and you're you're exactly right. So our very experienced maintenance test maintenance technicians who have been doing this for a long time, they know that equipment pretty well, right? They can go up and they can listen to it and they can say, "Oh, that's a bearing problem," right? They mm-hmm. they have been around this equipment long enough, and so helping them to really adopt a new technology that can add, it doesn't take away that knowledge, but it really supplements that knowledge can be hard. But that's why I think our customer success and the way that we do that is so important because it helps to demonstrate that value in real time. So if you put, let's say general as a general term, if you put sensors on a piece of equipment, you'll get alerts, right? At some point, you'll get an alert that something's wrong. Someone maybe goes out and fixes it, or someone maybe thinks they know better than the technology, right? From their experience, they know that equipment. They may not take action, um, or or they might. But the way to really help people adopt that and to kind of create that cultural shift is to demonstrate the value in real time. So versus waiting until you get to the end of the year and saying, oh, we saved you X hours of work and X dollars, right? Okay, sure, that doesn't mean anything to me when I'm looking back. But if I can say, hey, John, I saw that you went out and fixed this. We discovered this. You did this. You would have done this before for this exact moment. I think it makes it real for people right away and it encourages them to keep taking action and keep listening. So having a person that's following up when those issues are happening and being able to really demonstrate the value right then, I think helps a lot of those experienced technicians understand the value and see the value and be able then to bring their own expertise in and really make it a well-rounded solution. Yeah. I love to see that. I love to see when, when you can work together with people like that. And I think we have to, I mean, we have to, because, um, you know, the knowledge shift that's happening with, with people retiring, which is always a thing, but we have so many people, um, new coming into our industry. And even if they were in a different industry, like you are in healthcare and then coming over to us, um, it's nice to have these processes in place, to, um, that they can benefit for, from if, you know, the person leaves that has all the knowledge. And so this is definitely important to look at um, as we move forward. And, you know, is there anything like that um, as far as um, young professional trainings or any type of training that y'all are putting on to kind of educate people around this system or yeah. just just digital, digital services in general? Yeah, we do. So um, I'm part of a team at Grunfuss that does just that, that kind of educates people on that. I know there's a lot of, um, you know, regional players who put on different trainings. And then we also have through our service department, actual service training too. So that would train you on the digital side of things, right? So what to look for in your machines, but also in how to service them once you figure out what your issue is. So I can tell you your issue is misalignment, but if you don't know how to go out and laser align a machine, you're contracting someone or you're stumbling through it, it's nice to have that experienced person to walk you through the first few times, right? And so we we do try to provide that as a service as well. I think that's the thing I love the most about the service side of pumps and equipment in Grunfuss is that the focus is really on being a partner with our customers. So I'm not just selling you a product, right? I'm not just trying to give you a pump to, to solve the pump problem. I'm giving you a pump. I'm also teaching you how to service that pump. I'm helping you to make sure it stays running, that it's the right pump, that it's efficient, that you know you can really kind of partner more with the customers and, and become a good unit so that you're turnkey helping everyone feel better, right? At the end of the day, these are people who are, who are yes. working on the equipment. And so helping them to feel good about what they're doing, to feel like they're equipped with the right skills and the knowledge and the tools to do their job well. I think everybody wants that. And that's something that's really rewarding for me personally. Yeah. And just making it easier for us so that we can focus on what's important. That's for sure. I mean, I love all these different things that can tell us what the problem is without us, you know, having to walk, you know, to the other side of the plant and look at it ourselves. Um, That's a helpful thing. Now, um, I like the flexibility of being able to walk to the other side. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, I think that that, like you said, putting it together um, as a team and having people to lean on, um, that's what this collaborative collaborative uh, approach that I see more and more is, you know, working together to find the solution to make sure everything is um, not just 
you know, uh, re- responding or reacting to something in the moment. Um, and I think some of the times you do have to react in the moment, but thankfully now we have a ways to capture what was going on. You know, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? How could we better prepare for this? Um, so a lot, all of this stuff is just great. Uh, I, I love being able to learn something new about our partner. Um, Grumpus is a new partner for us. And so we are um, l- getting to know you a little bit better too. Um, the service side of the industry, I think, has a lot of potential to grow um, as far as what we're sharing as in content too. So I'm really thankful that you came on and you know sh- shared that with us. I- I'm also really just interested in you as a person. So I just have <laughs> to ask you about this. Um, and, you know, as you're kind of, I guess, early on, and you'll have to tell me about this, when did you actually teach these high school girls um, rugby? And where did so, that come from? <laughs> so I started playing rugby actually in high school in Indiana, of all places, um, and played for around 10 years before my body kind of gave up on me. So then um, it's one of those sports I think that you can get really addicted to and so I was like oh I can't play anymore you know my knee and I got a bump shoulder and what am I going to do and the answer was was coach right so I went back uh gosh so I moved down to Texas around three years ago and I was coaching before that so it's probably been five years or so ago now I, I would love to get involved with another team down here but uh it's so fun where are I, you where are you now Dallas Texas Dallas yes mm-hmm. okay well it's such an empowering sport, I think, for women, too, because, I mean, rugby is a very, like, rough and tumble sport, right? It's a full contact. Yeah, I mean, I You're first saw it, uh, in Australia. I was in Australia, and I got to see, you know, that. And, you know, I was telling Bethany on the podcast, it's like, I didn't even know this existed for girls. Like, what, a, you know, this just shows you, and I'm open, right? I'm super open to empowering women. And I was like, I didn't know girls were playing rugby and you've been playing for quite some time. So, yep. so that's uh, bad for me here uh, as far as <laughs> not being educated, but it's exciting too, because, you know, there's just another thing telling us that we can do anything um, that we set our mind to. So you're looking for get, maybe getting back into that in Dallas, but um, you know, you've got your teams that you were mentoring and Mm -hmm. and, I mean, was that part of it or is it more just like, you know, I just got to be next to this sport? It was both really. I mean, I love, I think, you know, my passion around sustainability also like ties really well in with my passion for, I call it training, but it's really teaching, Mm -hmm. right? Anything where you can kind of help instruct and kind of bring, bring people up and, and help them to understand new concepts. And that was something that I really loved about coaching was being able to to teach a sport of course but more than that for these young women is around teaching that confidence and the, speaking up for yourself and you know taking control of situations and working together teamwork is huge i think with any mm-hmm. sport being able to learn how to work together and how to collaborate is useful in any industry i mean i definitely have found use for it in my life but in any industry you go into and i think anything you can do to help bring the next generation into that and making them, I mean, feel empowered is the best word I keep using it, but right. feel empowered I love right? the word around here <laughs> is yeah. So that it was great for me. It was, it was the best of both worlds, teaching and rugby together. And it was great. Plus staying fit. Yeah. I, <laughs> I played basketball and um, I remember getting a leadership award and that was the first time I'd ever even thought of the term leadership. And that was in um, high school. So it's a great time to be being that person that influences people and tells them, you know, they can, um, you you know, I think that's just, I can, or, you know, that's a a big statement. Um, And to your point on leadership or uh, teamwork, um, it teaches, sports teach you so much about um, teamwork and how to deal with situations as they're coming. And so I think it's a great thing for everyone. So thanks for letting me, um, you know, share about that. And, you know, just, Sustainability as a whole, I think it's core to Grumpus, it's core to our industry and because we can um, create changes that, that matter and make a significant difference, especially around water. But are there any other kind of hot uh, trends or topics or however you want to say that around sustainability? I guess there, there are 17 of them, um, <laughs> the goals around sustainability that, you know, you're tied to. I mean, I think we a lot of what we're doing really ties into most of those, right? And our, our general concept at Grunfuss, right, is pioneering changes to 
to water and climate change is improving the lives of people. And I mean, just that mission statement, you could tie all of those, um, yes. I guess, like metrics to that, right? And so I really think that this obviously hits climate change, but even more significant, I don't want to say significant, I guess, but more visible to me right now today, climate change, of course, we're all trying to impact that, but we won't see the results of that for some time. But being able to improve the lives of the people that I'm working with and that I'm partnering with, I mean, that's a huge piece that, of our mission that I see day in and day out with this type of solution, because you can talk to the maintenance manager who now got to go to sleep last night, you know, for a while, yes. or when he came in, his blood pressure wasn't crazy through the roof because he knew what to expect and he knew what his top priorities were and what to, you know, deal with when he walked in the door and talking to people and having them really say that it's just like so immediate. It's such an immediate way to get that fulfillment and, and keep moving and, and ties right back into our mission. So I think it's uh Service is, is the way of the future, I guess. I mean, it's happening now, but to your point, I think we're going to see more and more of these type of offerings as, you know, technology improves and as adoption picks up. And especially with all these new um, technicians and new people coming into the field, you know, they have great new ideas and it's awesome to hear them and, and put them into action. Yeah, I agree. And I do believe that improving people's lives and actually thinking about that on a regular basis is that's how you're going to win it at business or life. Like it's, it's both and it's, it's what's important. And so um, thank you for all that you're doing. You can see it in your personal life as well as your work <laughs> and how you're just wanting to, to help people. Is there anything else just as we've been talking that you're like, you want to leave our listeners with? I don't think so. I think we've pretty well covered it. I mean, I would just say as you're, you know, going in your own professional journeys and you're, you're looking for whether that be, you know, employers that you're going to work for, vendors that you're going to partner with as your company. I mean, as long as you're looking at those things and considering your vision alignment and the impact that you're having outside of just right the bottom line, I need a pump, I need it to give me this much at this pressure and that's it. You know, look at some of those other pieces because I think there's a whole world of offerings out there that you're probably not familiar with and I'm not necessarily familiar with, but there's a lot of opportunity to really make everything easier and better for everyone. So. Just have those it. conversations. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to do a quick wa- rapid fire for you just for, for a little fun. Um, okay. So what is your favorite book? Oh, gosh. I don't even know if I could choose one. I was obsessed with all the Harry Potter books when I was younger, and, and I am still obsessed with them. So I guess I would okay. say probably those. Awesome. Okay. And now, um, you know, favorite song. I know this one's really tricky. It's probably more tricky than the book. You know, my mind just went blank when you said that. I listen to so much music. I love country music uh, first okay. and then, yeah, pop music too. But I don't even know if I could pick a song. Okay. Uh, and then okay, what is your best advice that you were ever given? Hmm. I have a lot of little nuggets from my dad that he doesn't realize that he leaves me with most of the time. But I think... Th- is around decision making. So he said, anytime you want to make a decision and you're really passionate about it, take a walk around the block, take a walk, come back. If you still want to do it, then do it. Right. But don't make decisions quickly. And I have done that my whole life when I decide something, whether I physically take a walk or I just go do something else for a while before I make a decision. It's, I always do that before I pull the trigger. And that has been oh. such a good piece of advice. Yes, I agree. That is a huge, a huge piece of advice. Okay. So I'm going to give you the opportunity now to leave others with a piece of advice. What would you tell somebody um, just to, from yourself? Oh gosh. Um, I would say listen to each other. I think that's something that gets missed uh, a lot in in personal life and professional life, but really listening to people with the intention of understanding what they have to say rather than how you're going to respond is probably my biggest piece of advice because I have found that to be such a differentiator for me, again, personally and professionally. When I listen, I'm ready to say something, but if I stop and actually hear what they're saying, a lot of times I say something else because what they're saying isn't necessarily what I'm hearing. So yeah, just listen to understand, not to respond. I love it. Well, if anybody wants to contact you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, me personally, you can email me at ahunter at grunfuss.com or anyone on our team will be there for US Digital at grunfuss.com or you can call me at 331-302-8524. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today.
And we're back. Charlie, thanks for bringing Amanda on the show. It, she had some really insightful tips that I know that our audience got a lot out of. Yeah. And, you know, this is not my favorite part, but this brings us to the end of the show. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, subscribe, rate and review the podcast with a positive review. We really appreciate it and read it. I get on and check those reviews to make sure that we're on track and we're doing what you like to hear here at the show. Um, yeah. And like, and subscribe. I don't know if we say that enough, like, and subscribe, please. (laughs) Okay. Um, so you can always reach us at empowering pumps or using the hashtag empowering industry podcast or email podcast at empowering pumps.com. We'll be back every Monday with a new episode. And next Monday, Charlie and I will be, well, the episode that comes out next Monday, Charlie and I will be together in my yes. house. Maybe this office. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, but we'll be together recording the podcast. So I think it'll be super fun. I'm excited to be with you in person. It's going to be awesome. So until then, be empowering. Be empowering.